Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God bless you. God bless you for joining. We are late. We are late. Uh, was handling some issues, but the Lord is on our side. Has all blessing. God bless you. How are you? <clears throat> now, I, I want to teach on what I entitled, Why do you marry? I want to teach on what I entitled, Why do you marry? And I believe... This will bless you. Hazel, I want you to share this broadcast. Charlene, share this broadcast. God bless you. Invite a friend. Pasid, Vanessa. Why do you marry? Why do you get married? Why do people marry? Or why do people get married? I want to handle this as a topic. And... I want you to do me a favor. I want you to share the broadcast. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to share this broadcast. I want somebody to know that the man of God is online. Just share the broadcast. I will go straight into the word because time is not on our side. We are late by far. We are already by far late with 35 to 40 minutes closely. So please do me a favor. Quickly share this broadcast to 10, 12 friends, 10, 12 groups. Let a friend know that the prophet of God is online. Let somebody know that we are live. And I want to teach on what I call the topic. I'm teaching on marriage, but the title is Why Do People Marry? Why do people marry? Why do you marry? Why do you get married? Glory to God. Why do people marry and why do people get married? Marriage is a honorable thing. And marriage, you know, is initiated by God. Marriage is a honorable thing. Marriage is initiated by God. God is the author of marriages. And every marriage is centered on God. Either God is the one who started it or God is the one who, you know, everything that is around marriage, to be precise, marriage is authored by God. Marriage is authored by God. So then, why do we then marry? Why do we then marry? I want you to share this broadcast widely. I just want you to share this broadcast widely. I just want you to share it widely and let somebody know that the prophet is live. Just share it widely and let somebody know that the prophet of God is live. Let me know who is watching. She God that God bless you. Long time. Long time, long time, long time, long time. Long time, long time, long time, long time, long time. Long time. Now, marriage is to be enjoyed. Let me begin from there. Marriage is something that people ought to enjoy. Marriage is not supposed to be endured. Marriage is something that people ought to enjoy. Marriage is not supposed to be endured. But you find that people endure marriage. When you see people, they endure marriage. There is something wrong. So as far as I'm concerned, marriage is supposed to be enjoyed. Why should marriage be enjoyed? Because marriage was designed by God. Marriage was orchestrated, planned, founded by God. Mac Vanessa is connected from Gabaron. Vanessa, God bless you. Now, 
Marriage is supposed to be enjoyed. Marriage is also supposed to be endured. But what happens? Why then do people endure? There are those that either they are not in marriage because they were crying. So they said, better I stay out. So I will explain a few things. I will explain a few things here that you need to understand. But I want you to share this broadcast. God bless you, Doris. God bless you, Ophelia. God bless you. God bless you. Share the broadcast. Let somebody know that we are live. We are a bit late, but never. We are, we bet, they say better late than never. Amen. Why do people marry? Hazel, why do people get married? Jenny Hado. God bless you, Jenny from Canada. Share the broadcast, Jenny. God bless you. God bless you. Share this broadcast widely. Just let somebody know that the prophet of God is online. Just share it widely. Why do people marry? Marriage is supposed to be enjoyed. Marriage is not supposed to be endured. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verses number 5. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the verse number 5. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the verse is number 5. Jenny Pepaho, God bless you, Maureen. God bless you. Share this broadcast. Why do people marry? Marriage, I said, God is the author of marriage. Because God is the one the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, and um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that God created a man and gave him dominion in chapter 2, and God saw that it was not good for a man to be alone. So then God created for man the helpmate. So then, why do people marry? Why do people get married? Like I said in the beginning, marriage is supposed to be enjoyed, not to be endured. But you realize that many people are married, but they are enduring. They are not enjoying. They are married, yes, but they are enduring. Amen. So let's read then, so we can go deeper. I want you to share this broadcast. I want you to share this broadcast. Share the broadcast. First Timothy chapter 5 and verses number chapter 3 verse number 5. Sorry. Chapter 3 verse number 5. First Timothy 3 and verses 5. Timothy 3 5. Aha. Uh -huh. Favor, you are blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed. I want you to share. If you love it, share it. If you love it, share. Sharing is caring. La sharing is caring. Chapter 3, verse 5. We are there to go. <clears throat> and we are good to go. The Bible says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of his of the church of God? Now, in, in this scripture, the Lord is talking about the church in regarding to, in connection to ministry. And of marriage in connection to ministry. He said, if a man know not how to take care of his house, how can he take care of a church of God? So when somebody is in ministry, they need to know the place of marriage and the place of ministry. Okay? A man in marriage and is doing ministry, a woman in marriage and doing ministry, need to know the place of marriage and ministry. So I, I, want, to, I want to put this so you need to know then how to do your marriage before you know how to do ministry. Okay. For if a man know not how to do his house, how will he take care of the house of God? Okay. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Let me, let me show you some scriptures before we go deeper because I, I will not be doing a lot of reading. Genesis, let's start from chapter 1 and verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Genesis 1 26. Shaka bala bala bala. Okay. Then God said, let us make money in our image according to our likeness. 
and let the man have dominion of the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, all uh, over all the earth, all of the, the cattle, over the all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps over the earth. 27. So God created man in his image. And in the image of God, he created him. That is Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Okay. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Bible said then, And the Lord said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Then the Lord, after creating man in his image, God saw it was not good for a man to be alone. The word man in this context refers to both man and female. So God saw it was not good for a man to be alone. So when God says it's not good for a man to be alone, I say it's not good for a woman to be alone either. Because a man does not marry an animal, a man marries a human being. So if God says it's not good for a man to be alone, then in other side, God is trying to say it's not good either for a woman to be alone. Are we together? So if God says it's not good for a man to be alone, then it means it's not good for a woman to be alone. Then we go. So then God created for Adam an helpmate fit for him. Adam was created an helpmate fit for him. And therefore, meaning that every woman, every man has a man and a woman has a man. Every man has a woman. Created fit for him, fit for her. Now, the reason I want you to share this broadcast is because the revelation I want to teach tonight is so deep in such a way that somebody somewhere need to listen to it. There is a woman somewhere this night. There is a there is a man somewhere tonight that the only thing that will deliver her from committing suicide is this message. There is a friend of yours. That the only thing that will deliver her from stress is this message. So do me a favor. Just type that button and share. As many times as God gives you grace to do. Okay. So I said therefore, marriage is supposed to be enjoyed. Marriage is not supposed to be endured. Write that one down. Why should marriage be enjoyed? Because anything that is authored by God, God has planted, purposed, and orchestrated it in a way that nobody should struggle with it. The Bible says that blessings of the Lord does not come along with sorrow. So then let me ask you, since God is the author of marriages, should marriages come with sorrow? No. For the blessings of the Lord does not carry sorrow along. And listen to me. Marriage is supposed to be enjoyed why should marriage be enjoyed? God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. I want you to go with me one by one. God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The word Eden here refers to delight. The word Eden refers to delight. The meaning of the word Eden is delight. To be delighted is to be happy, is to be, to be enjoying. You know, is a delightful moment, is an enjoyable moment. So the word Eden it refers to what I call enjoyment. So then we are saying the Lord placed Adam and Eve in a place of enjoyment, in the place of garden of Eden. And Eden means delight, means enjoyment. Are we together? May God give you peace as I'm even teaching this thing. I want everybody at the sound of my voice to share because the revelation I will release tonight as God has put in my spirit is so deep in such a way that you need to share it. Okay. So marriage should be enjoyed. Why? God placed Adam and Eve at the Garden of Eden. Eden means a place of delight, place of enjoyment. So then if I marry or if I am married, then I expect to enjoy and it's not, it's not that when I enjoy, it is wrong. It is right for me to enjoy my marriage. Why? Because it is authored by God. And what is authored by God, men 
ought to enjoy. And the word Eden in this context means place of delight, place of enjoyment. So if I marry, if I get married, then it is expected of me to have peace, to enjoy. So then when you realize that you are married and you marry, but you are not enjoying, then there is an error that has to be addressed. So the first question is, why do you marry? Maybe you can text an answer. Somebody can just answer me through the text. Why do people marry? Why do you think you should be married? Or why did you marry if you're already married? If you're a woman, you're a man. You're already married. Why did you marry? If you can answer me that question. Maybe just text it. Just text it on a public wall. Don't, don't worry. Why do you marry? If you can answer that question right, you're good to go. Why do you marry? Can I have, tell somebody, just text and answer what is in your mind. Just write it. Because, okay, husband blessing is saying for companionship, okay? <clears throat> so people marry for companionship is because they were feeling single, they were feeling lonely. People who marry for companionship are trying to address loneliness. So the day your loneliness is taken care of, you can choose to begin to misbehave. Let me tell you. Good, you should marry for companionship. Perfect. Because it's not good for you to be alone. You need companion. Okay? But if companionship is the only thing, if companionship is the only thing that has pushed you into that marriage, at some point, nature, nature above all, you know, nature does not allow vacuum. Okay? Nature does not allow vacuum. Number two, nature detects nature predicts or nature you know nature brings i don't know how to put it but nature did uh, because of com because god commanded uh-huh okay that's a bit deep i will i will i will explain on that one why do people marry companionship a divine purpose uh, if you marry for companionship it is correct but there is something that is missing so favor is saying because God commanded. So that one has short-circuited. Can I have somebody else trying? Can I just have some two, three, four people trying? I think we marry for companionship. It's good you think that way. It's correct. It's a correct answer. But I'll, 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 just, I'll just take you a little deeper. What? Everybody married for companionship. Then after marrying for companionship, you realize that they, they still divorced. So let me ask you, you married for companionship, then now you divorced. So do you mean now you don't need companionship when you're divorced? Okay. Um, Florence is saying for companionship. Jenny is saying to accomplish divine purpose. Uh, Faber is saying because God commanded. Maureen is saying help meet destiny. Number two, companionship. Number three, protection. All of the answers are right. Let me get some of you. Don't fear. I want to know what is in your mind so that I tell you what the Lord has put in my spirit. God made man to be with a woman. So meaning, Ophelia, you are agreeing with favor. You are saying, because God commanded. Perfect. Perfect. All the answers are right. All the answers are right. Let me just get. Now, once I get like 10 answers, I'll begin to give you dimensions on what God has commanded me to speak. And that's why I say it, you need to share this broadcast to a minimum of 12 groups. There are people who need to know. Do you know there are people who are married now, but they don't know why they are married? Some people marry because of lust. You know, you, you feel you miss a woman. You just feel you miss a woman. You need to marry one and put in your house for yourself. Mm -hmm. You feel you are missing a man. So you just feel you need to marry a man and keep a man so that you don't go looking for what you, you know, you just, let me have a man for myself. Let me just have a woman for myself. Okay? We marry by revelation to explain. Can I have it? Can I get you right? Okay, Jenny saying, we marry by revelation to express the love of God through divine purpose. Correct? To take care of each other since each has their duty to the other. Correct? We marry by revelation. Every answer is correct. 
Every else is correct, but I will show you revelatory how God has spoken to me about this. Now, many times, many a times, like I begin to say, <clears throat> let me say those are the answers that we have. But I want you to type seven times as I'm teaching, Lord, give me peace. I just want you to type seven times by revelation. By revelation, God, give me peace. I just want you to type it seven times by revelation. God, give me peace. God, give me peace. God, give me peace. Lord, give me peace. If you still have an, a contrary opinion, you can bring it. I, I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Number one, I said, uh -huh. we might to fulfill the word of God. Okay. 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 Like I said before, all answers are correct. All answers are correct and perfectly correct. Correct and perfectly correct. Now listen. Listen. The Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. And God then created a helpmate for the man. Okay. So God saw it was not good for a man to be alone. So God created a helpmate for the man. So then we said people marry for companionship. People marry to help meet destiny. People marry, you know, for this and for that. But listen. Let me explain something before I continue. Men, some men marry beauty. Some men marry shape. Some women marry beauty. Some women marry body size or a six pack or is that, you know, okay. Um, some people marry because the woman is doing well. And I am frustrated. I don't have money. So the woman will take care of me. Men, some men, some women also get married to men because those men had money and she doesn't want to be frustrated any longer. Some marry because of wealth, material. You know, I just want a man, you know, who has so, so much. Some marry because... I've come to the end of my line. So whatever come my way, I will marry. Tom, Dick, and Harry, provided they will ask me a question, will you marry me? I'll marry because I want a man over my life. I'm marrying because I want a woman to be called a wife. So some are married to cover their shame. Some are married for their family name because my family people will say all of us are not married. So at least let me marry. So at least it, it is, you know, at least, at least let it break the norm. You know, you are married to break the norm. Your first born sister was not married. Second was not married. Third was not married. You are the fourth. So you are saying, let me marry for, you know, to break that protocol. Now that is one. There are those who are married because I've been looking for somebody to settle down with. And since nobody serious is coming, and this is the only one coming, let me marry. That's another reason. Just marrying for marrying sake. Three, let me marry so that people also know that I can be married. Mm hmm Marry so that people may also know I can marry or I can be married. There are those who are marrying because the woman is wealthy and the man is struggling financially. So the woman is wealthy and the man is struggling. So the man is, you know, the man is, you know, you know, he wants a man wants a woman that can keep her in. Or a woman is marrying a man that is rich or is already having money. You know, money is the basis. Number five, some people are marrying, I said, because of beauty. Some people are marrying because of money. Some people are marrying because family, you know, my family name. Let me do it to protect. Some people are marrying because this is the only thing that I had to do. My friends are mocking me. So let me marry so that they know I can be married. I'm not as they thought. And number five, some people are marrying because of, um, of peer pressure. My colleagues are marrying, everybody are being married, so I also need a man. So I need a woman for myself. Everybody has a wife around me, so I also need one. Others marry because they don't want to look for sex. You understand? 
and they don't want to suffer last. They don't want to be masturbating. They don't want to be, you know, in this and that. They don't want to be stressed because of, you know, last of the body. So they say, better I marry and have my own wife. Better I marry and have my own husband. So, so some people marry because of that. Some people marry because of lust. The woman was too beautiful to allow another man to marry. So he said, let me keep her for myself. And then now people forget that all of these things we mentioned, majority of them, they fade away. One, when you marry beauty, there is only the far beauty can go. Beauty fades away. When you marry money, there is a point money can be challenged. I don't say that money must, you must, you must lose or you must, you know, at some point lack money. Mm -mm. There is a time in life when money can be challenged. So if you marry because of money, the day that woman has no money, the day that man don't have money, then that marriage has ended. The day you marry beauty, the day beauty begins to go down, that marriage cannot stand. The day you marry because of your family, nobody was married. So let me stand at least, let me try and get a man to marry me or let me get a woman for myself to break that, you know, that, that, that whatever. The day the rest of them that were not married are finally married. Because no status is permanent. So the day now the rest of your sisters are now married. Now, now you realize you married the wrong person when you are married to cover your family's name. So then now, what? So now you realize it's a challenge. You realize it's a challenge. You have nothing to do. You have nothing to do. You have married this person. You have four children. You realize he was not your husband. You have five children. You wanted to protect your family name. You have messed yourself. You know what I'm saying? So all of these things people talk. People marry celebrities. You know, people know him everywhere. People know her everywhere. So, you know, when I walk with her, people will know me as somebody. So, you know, you are marrying celebrity. You are marrying, you know, you are marrying the celeb part of the person. You are not marrying the personality. So later then you realize that you married but a, you know, a mirage. I, I beg everybody to share this broadcast. You realize therefore that you married a mirage. Now there is no companion. Now there is no love. Now there is no understanding. There is no unity. I will tell you. I was teaching, if you check on our YouTube channel, how to identify that this is my wife. And it was a very serious topic. And I asked questions. How would somebody know this is my husband? How will I know when I'm marrying this is my wife? How will I know when I'm marrying this is my husband? How will I know when I'm marrying this is the man I should stay with? This is the woman I should stay with? That has been a challenge to many people. And people married men and women, they didn't even know if they are the wife or the husband. And finally they are staying together. Now you begin to ask God, was he the one? You're ready with him. Was she the one? You're ready with her. Was she the one? She already have two of your children. Was she the one? You already have three children with her. You know what I'm saying? So one, I said marriage is supposed to be enjoyed, not to be endured. So why do people marry? People should marry, number one, because God commanded that marriage. It is not good for a man to be alone. So I must marry because God said it is not good. So if God said it is not good, whether Pope says it is good, for reverend fathers to be single, it is wrong. As far as God has said it is not good, it is not good. It doesn't matter what Pope is saying. It doesn't matter what Prophet Oma is saying. Once God has said it is not good, it is not good. So therefore, then it is good at least you get a man for, you know, you know, you marry. Even if you, the, the man maybe is not born again and the man misbehaves and then at some point the marriage could not stand. But you as a believer, you have done your own part. You have obeyed the voice of God. It's not good for me to be alone. I've, I've, I've done my part. God has done his part. My, my wife misbehaved or my man misbehaved. But at least God say it's not good. And that is the final thing. Okay. So we marry therefore then because God has commanded. Number one. Number two. Everybody want to love and to be loved. Everybody want to love and to be loved. And every time when somebody is not loved and they don't love in return, stress, depression, and such kind, you begin to realize there's, you know, ulcers and pressure and you know what, and sugar levels, and you begin to struggle with this. And some funny diseases come to you 
which wouldn't have come into your life. You open yourself to attacks. You know, you open yourself to lust. You open yourself to masturbation. You open yourself to, to, to pornography. You open yourself to so much evil things that you could have opened yourself into. So Paul then says, if you know because of lust of the flesh, then marry a wife for yourself. If you know you cannot manage the lust of the flesh, then marry a husband for yourself. Because of the lust of the flesh. So meaning, therefore, that also the flesh part comes to play. Because there are things that your father can't tell you, but your husband or your boyfriend is the one who can tell you. There are things your mother can't give you, but your wife can give you. So you understand? So there is the, the, there's that companion, yes. There is love, yes. But it is the will of God that I should marry. It is the will of God that you should be married. And number two, everybody wants to love and to feel loved. Number three, why do we marry? We marry because the Bible says, go ye and multiply. The Bible says, go ye and multiply. So we are doing it because it is in the divine mandate of God that I should multiply. Okay, the question therefore is, how can you journey multiply without a man? It happened one in the case of Jesus. So how then can I multiply without a woman? A man plus a woman, then we multiply. Without a woman, no multiplication. And God say, go ye and multiply. So when God say multiply, then it means therefore I must marry. Because I can't pray for children without a wife. A woman cannot pray for children without a man. So when God say, go and multiply, then God is expecting me to have a man so that I can marry. To have a wife I can, I can get married to. And I have children with a person to multiply. To fulfill the divine mandate, purpose of God upon your life. And that's why therefore the Bible says children are blessings from God. So once a woman and a man come together in agreement to marry, with the understanding of the biblical principle, let me tell you, how many people married saying, I married, I love this man. And the man said, I love the woman. And finally, they still did agree. The Bible says, love conquered all things. But in the beginning, the man you married, you said you loved him. The woman you married, you said you loved him. So where did love go? Because the reason why that man and that woman disagreed is because the love, the real what we call love wasn't there. Love conquered all things. What is love? God is love. And when you say love conquered all things, then you are saying God conquers all things. So if you marry on the basis of God, to whom in this case is love, then that marriage stands. But if you marry because of your feelings, which then you interpret to call love, then you are wrong. When you marry on the basis of your feelings, which then you interpret to call love, then you are wrong. Because what people call love in most cases is what you feel for somebody. And love has nothing to do with feelings. We interpret feelings to call them love. God is love. And love conquered all things. So then, love conquered all things. God conquered all things. So meaning, if you marry somebody you loved, then that God part, there should be godliness. That God part of marriage is what keeps marriage. Not what people interpret to call love. Because what people call love, 99% is lust. And if it's not lust, then it is a feeling you have towards somebody that pushed you. How do you discern when you are having feelings that are pushed from lust and when you have feelings that are pushed from love? How do you separate? How do you discern to know the feeling I'm having for this woman are based on the basis of my feelings? These feelings are coming from love. Or these feelings are stirred up by lust. How do you separate the two? So the God is love. And love conquered all things. It means therefore love conquered all things. God conquered all things. So if you marry a man or a woman based on godly principles, that woman may not know how to cook. You will cook for that woman for 30 years. 
and nobody will ever hear about it and people will be celebrating you outside but in the inside as a man you know you are crying but it was in the will of god that you stay with that woman so whether you're the one cooking or she's the one cooking it was the will of god that you stay that way and people and you will be peaceful cooking for her that's why you see a woman that the husband is open again the husband is drinking but she has stayed with that man for 20 years you if that man was given to you you cannot stay with the man for three months now what happens then when we marry in accordance to the will of God, God gives you grace to stay with that particular woman, that particular lazy man. God gives you special grace. You have seen a woman, the husband is beating her, beating her, and I'm not saying this should happen. I'm using it as an example. But you ask yourself, why is that woman staying with that man? She has grace to stay with the man. You, you don't have that grace. If the man is given to you one week, you cannot survive. So when you marry... And your marriage is based on godly principles. That's where we are. Then that marriage stands regardless. That marriage stands regardless. Whether you are a man, your wife does not know how to wash. She doesn't know how to, 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 you know, to iron. She doesn't know how to cook. She doesn't know how to talk. She doesn't know how to clean. But God gives you grace to stay with her. Some of your colleagues will be asking, how do you stay with that kind of lazy woman? But you, you feel this grace. Now that grace come with that godliness. But imagine if it was the shape that pushed you. If it was the, the color of the woman. If it was the status of the woman. If it was the family she came from. Then now once you realize that she cannot do this, you stop it. If you marry a man that cannot satisfy you on bed. And you married that man and that was your ordained man. God gives you grace to stay with a man that cannot satisfy you. But if you don't marry a man that can satisfy you when you married wrongly, then that is when now you begin to look for a man outside or a woman outside to satisfy you. I pray somebody will share this. This is too deep to listen only by these people that I'm seeing here. As a believer, number one, I said marriage should be enjoyed. Number two, as a believer, if your marital life is paralyzed, you will realize that your ministry life is affected. Because of the Bible and also the acceptability in the Christian dom. People tend to believe naturally from what is written in 1 Timothy 3 verse 5. That you should have a good house for you to have a good ministry, which is not true. Because I know some single women and single men that are doing very well in ministry. But somehow, somehow, there is a way people that go into full ministry, they face challenge if this area is disturbed. Now listen, how then should I go about marriage? For you, the man or the woman that you are marrying, the man or the woman you are marrying, you should have what I call common interest. You should have what I call common interest in so many things. Because those are the few things. You know, a time comes naturally when the first love begins to go down. The first feelings a woman and a man had for each other begin to go down. Now what we keep you together sometimes is not children. People say children are keeping people together. And it's a lie because I've seen many people with children and children never kept them together. There are times when now children can't keep it together. It's the common interest. Maybe ministry was your common interest. So you are staying with your wife. This and this and this and this in your husband, in your wife is not doing you good. But because there is a common interest, there is a common interest. You know, we want to do the work of God and see the work of God to the next level. So we cannot concentrate on divorce and the work of God will be jeopardized. So then you realize the common interest that you have keep the two of you together. Though my husband is not a good man, but we have a common interest. So let's do this marriage for kingdom's sake. You know, there is something that we are doing together. You know, when people don't have common interest, I will tell you as a man of God, and this one I may not draw from any scriptural background, but listen to me. When there is no common interest, sometimes when the feelings you people had for each other begin to go down, nothing holds you together. Children can hold you so far, but there is a place you get when children can't hold you any longer. 
Because you will, you will, a woman will say, I can't die because of children. And a man will say, I can't suffer because of children. So, but if there is what is keeping you together, you know, we want to make heaven. So this divorce is not an option. Though I know my wife is doing this, I know my husband is doing that, but let me not focus on our weakness. Let me focus on we want to make impact. I'm using ministry for example. So when there is common interest, God is the basis. Eh? And, and genuine, what I call genuine love is involved, then there is peace. Amen. Now, what are the hindrances to marriage? What are, hind what, what are these things that hinder honor in marriage? Number one, there are things that can de deprive you of honor in your own marriage. One is what I call stubbornness. Stubbornness. <clears throat> when one of the two is very stubborn, and one of the two or both, none of you or one of the two is always stubborn. They don't want to, to accept that they are wrong. That marriage, that relationship cannot stand. Now listen to me. We say in Swahili, kunyanyakea siyo ujinga. That is me. English, it means to mean in English, um, to, to say I'm sorry does not make you stupid. I don't know if I'm translating it right. To say I'm sorry does not make you stupid. Or, you know, to humble yourself doesn't make you stupid. As far as marriage is concerned, why win argument and lose your marriage? I prefer I lose argument but I win my marriage. So then, better you, if you don't understand these simple things, you realize your struggle. Better you lose argument and win your marriage. Better people see you stupid, but they will come and celebrate your 20 years in marriage. Stubbornness deprive people of honor in their marriages. That is one. Number two thing that can deprive of honor, deprive you of honor in your marriage is bitterness. Keeping record of wrongdoings. And here, God has to deliver majority of the people. You know, you are your wife or your boyfriend or your whatever you call it offended you two years ago. Then you have space in your heart where you keep evil. So any day any wrong comes, any another, because we are human, the same way you wrong the person is the same way he can wrong you. So if you are a human being who eats and goes to the toilet, then it means you can make a mistake. Now, you do have to think that your partner is perfect so that they cannot do a mistake. And the day you think that way, that is the beginning of your fall. You must be ready to say, I'm sorry. Not because you are the one who is wrong, but you want to keep your marriage. Let me tell you, bitterness and keeping evil record will deprive peace out of your marriage. And once peace is taken out of that marriage, that marriage is gone. That's why you people you hear people saying, me, I'm just here because of my children. Me, I'm just here because we bought a property together. Me, I'm just here because we did this. So you hear people talking about things, they forget about self. Now, what do we do for love to continue in marriage? For those that are already married and those who are believing God to marry. And those who are taking notes, may God bless you. Because what I'm teaching here, this is, these are part of what I'm writing in my book. My fourth book, about, I'm writing on who stole my wedding gown. That is the fourth book I'm writing. The second book, we are launching it this coming Sunday. And I pray that those who, are, who can make it, please make it this coming Sunday. We are launching the second book, Understand. I mean, The Prophetic Eye. My first book is on understanding the prophetic. The second book is The Prophetic Eye. The third book, I'm writing on the priesthood. The fourth book is Who Stole My Wedding Gown. Part of what I'm teaching here, I've put them there now into details. We have the Voice of the Prophet conference that is going on. We started on today. It was powerful. If you didn't listen to the teaching, I want you to take time and go back on our YouTube. Prophet Robert Ouma, you'll find it there on our YouTube channel. You'll find it on our Facebook channel. Like and follow and subscribe. Listen to me. 
What do I need to do for love to continue in my relationship? One, for those that are writing, you must be tolerant. No, I'm not saying you should be tolerant. You must be tolerant for love to continue in your marriage. A lot of tolerance has to come to play. If you are not tolerant enough, that you cannot continue. Number two, you must be kind. Help your wife, help your husband where necessary. Be kind. And I don't know why, I don't know why sometimes men feel they can't help their wives because that's the, a woman's responsibility. And I also don't know why sometimes women feel they can't help their husbands because that's a man's responsibility. Be kind to your husband. Be kind to your wife. Though is his work. Though is our work. But po for posterity, you want to be as happy as that woman you have been admiring. There is the price she has paid that make you to admire her. Are you willing to pay the same price? Be able to help. Do you have money? Help him. Do you know how to do this? Help him. If he's a woman, if he's a man, sometimes you can cook for your wife. It doesn't make you stupid. I say it. Humility is not stupidity. They almost sound the same, but they're different. The fact that you are helping your wife sometime once in a while with the house calls, and that one also does not make a woman to you know you know want you want to make your husband to be the one doing it. Eh? Eh? No, 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 no. I'm talking about matured people who know what I'm teaching. No somebody want to manipulate their wives. You know, you want you to just be eating your wife's money. No, I don't want somebody who are not teaching on manipulating your husband. So your husband should be changing diapers for your baby and uh, washing your children. And you, you are watching, you know, television or something. I'm not teaching that. I'm teaching on people who might, are matured. And they know what I'm talking about. Number three way to maintain love is be humble by keeping humility. Don't be proud. I say it. Humility is not stupidity. And the fact that you are humble does not mean you are stupid. In Swahili we say, You know, people can say, Oh, your wife is controlling you. Your husband is eating your money. But as far as you are peaceful with it, and you, you know that you are trying to maintain your own house. Concentrate in building your house. Don't concentrate on what people say. So as far as it is concerned, be humble. Pride sometimes will kill you. I know people that pride has costed them their jobs. Pride has costed them relationships. Pride has costed them so much. Be humble. Number four, sacrifice. Don't be selfish. For love to continue in your marriage, in your relationship, you must be willing, both of the two parties. What I'm saying is not supposed to happen only with a man or only with a woman. Is supposed to happen with both parties. Both parties must be ready and willing to sacrifice. This teaching, I pray you share it as much as possible. If you have 50 groups, I want to share it to as many groups as you can. Sacrifice in the context that you are not selfish. You are the man. What you have is your wife's. What is your wife's is yours. This analogy of women earning and why a woman's money is her money. A man's money is our money. is a wrong doctrine. is a wrong analogy. What is of the man is yours. What is of the wife is yours. Equally. And the last one, what do we do to maintain love in marriage? Keep purity. Keep thinking pure. Keep a pure thinking mentality. You know, there are men when they see their wives talking on a phone for long, you just think your wife is chatting somebody. You're always carrying a, a suspicion mentality. You're always suspecting your wife. Where is she going? What is she doing? What is she doing? Who is she talking to? Who is she chatting to? Or if you're the woman, you always suspect your husband. You know, you are always suspicious. You, you know, if your husband go like this, you think he's going to meet with a woman. If your husband go like that, you know, you always keep a pure mentality. Behave as if that woman cannot cheat on you. 
Though you know there is possibility, but don't allow your mind to even think it. Why am I saying this? The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is the man. So if you are thinking your wife is cheating, then you are the one cheating in the first place. If you think your wife, your man is cheating, then you are the one thinking in the first place. That's scripture. Because most cases where people think that their wives are cheating, in most cases they are even wrong. But now once you have pictured it in your mind, you are the one creating an environment for your wife not to go and cheat. In the realm of the spirit, if you are the one thinking your husband is cheating, in most cases when he is not, then you are opening room for him to start. So don't even allow those kind of thoughts. When they come, you rebuke it, you rebuke it, you don't allow it. Why? Because you want that marriage to stay. Now, these are the dangers that comes along when somebody is in marriage and they are not honest. Dangers of marital dishonesty. Dangers of marital dishonesty. Dangers of marital dishonesty. One, it affects your testimony. It affects your testimony. It affects your testimony. When people know you for a woman, that you are a manizer, every man you have tasted, you have tasted an African, you have tasted a white, you have tasted an Asian, you have tasted, I don't know, a Chinese. You are one woman, you have tasted all. Or you are one man, you have tasted the Nigerian. You have, you know, you, are, you, have, you, you don't carry good testimony as a believer. Number two, when you are a, a woman, a man, that you are married and you are, you know, you are not, you, you know, there is a lot of dishonesty. It, it hinders your prayer life. It hinders your prayer life. A lot. So then, you get to understand how to keep, you know, purity, honesty. Number three, it affects your giving life. Men that cheat a lot, they have many women around. They don't give. Most men, they are dating two, three women. They are not givers. Why? Because they want to take care of three women with the small money. So they must budget very well to please all the three women. And when they are trying to please the three women, they don't have extra or balance to give to God. If you are a woman that you are a manizer, you are dating one black man, one yellow man, one green man. You realize it affects your giving life because this man has a demand, this one has a demand, this has a demand. And for you to meet all the demands, you realize at least one, you must meet somewhere. Then it will affect your giving life. Now, what are the man's responsibility to his wife and his family? Now, what are the responsibility of the man to his family and to his wife? Because every man has a responsibility to his wife and responsibility to his family. Number one, the man is responsible to love his wife. The Bible says, and you men love your wives. And you wives submit to your husbands. So every man has a responsibility to love. Every man has a responsibility to love their wives. Love her. Whether she's a dirty woman, love her. Whether she's having, you know, she's waking up in the morning with mucus here, love her. Whether she wake up in the morning with saliva, love her. It is your responsibility. So you are not loving her because of her works. You are loving her because it is your responsibility. You are loving your wife not because of what she's doing. You are loving your wife not because of her beauty. You are loving your wife because it is your responsibility to love her. And God expects you to love your wife. Number two, responsibility of a man to his wife is to dwell with the her with wisdom. Deal with your wife with wisdom. Dwell with her with wisdom. Let God give you wisdom to deal with your wife. I will also show you a woman's responsibility to the husband as far as my revelation is concerned. So if you don't deal with your wife with some dimension of wisdom, you will misjudge your wife. You will misinterpret your wife. 
a lot. And when you misinterpret your wife, when you misunderstand your wife, and you misjudge your wife, that is when now you realize that marriage is struggling. So you must pray to God to give you wisdom so that you can dwell with her with wisdom. Number three, responsibility of a man to the wife. Make your wife your closest friend. It is your responsibility as a man to make your wife your friend. By the way, this one applies in both cases. Make it my responsibility as a wife and as a man. Let your wife be your closest friend. You don't chat other, other women more the way you chat your wife. Chat your wife, chat those women. You know, sorry. When you chat your wife, chat her more than you chat other women. Make her your best friend. Even if you have colleagues, you cannot chat a, a workmate more than the way you, you chat your own wife. You cannot chat a workmate more than the way you chat your husband. You cannot be chatting your boss more than the way you chat your wife or your husband. Because if that is the case, then would you talk with that boss that you can't talk with your wife? Number four, a responsibility of a man is to train his wife, I mean his children, in the way that they should go. It is the responsibility of the man. But in the African society, it is known that when children misbehave, people ask, where is the mother? In the African society, if a child is misbehaving, the first thing they will ask, whose mother is, is this child? But it is the reverse. It is the responsibility of the man. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 verse 6. So a wife takes the responsibility to train the child. The man takes the responsibility to train a child. Both of you put up equal responsibility. 50-50. Train the child. You rebuke the child, Papa rebuke the child. When the father rebukes the child, the mother rebukes the child. Both of you collectively take it responsibility. But what happens? When the child misbehaves, you tell your wife, uh, see the way you have trained your children. The, the wife also will tell the man, see the way you have trained your children. Let it be a collective responsibility. The Bible says, train your child. The Bible did not say, man, train your child. Wife, train your child. Mm, both of you should train. No, it's, it's not my own. It is ours. If I'm the man, it is mine and it's my wife's. If it is you as a woman, it is your responsibility to train the child and it's the responsibility of the man also to train. So both of you put equal efforts to upbring your children in the way that will please the Lord and will make you happy. When you grow old, when you see your children, you can say, I tried. First Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8. Care for, the, for their needs. Number, the next number, responsibility of a man. Care for the needs. Some of the responsibility here for the man is unisex. They are both for the man and the woman. It is the responsibility of the man to take care of his people. Financially, materially. He take care of their needs financially, materially. Buying them food, buying them clothes, pay their rent, buy them a car, let them feel good, take them out, pay for them, take them out. It is a, is a responsibility of the man. Let me show you in the Bible. 1 Timothy, chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8. The Bible says, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than a non-believer. If a man cannot take care of his family, that person has denied faith if he's born again. And that man is worse than a non-believer. So it is a responsibility of the man to take care of his family needs, pay their rent, buy their food, buy their clothes, make them feel good, buy them nice TV screen, pay their Wi-Fi, let your children feel good. It is biblically correct for a man to do that. And the Bible says, he who does not do that, even if they are born again, they have denied faith and they are worse than non-believers. They are worse than infidels. So a man should take care of their family. You do everything, whether you are going to do hard labor, do it, make your family comfortable. The second last one, irresponsibility, a man should help their children locate their plan 
and purpose in life. This is where many men fail. And if there is any man following here, let them hear what I'm saying. Every man should help their children identify their purpose of life. Let your child know what is my purpose for life. Many of us, we struggle in life because our parents did not help us. So you struggle alone. By the time you identify this is the plan of God for me, you're already old. For you now to begin to pursue that plan and achieve it, it would have costed a lot. You realize by the time you are dying, you have achieved very little. Why? Because your parents did not help you to identify the purpose of God for your life. Why am I saying so? You have grown. You know the life. You have prayed. You know how to design. You can look at your child and help them identify their purpose in life. But now what happens is that many a times, parents leave their children, you don't help them. So by the time they get to know what is the plan of God for themselves, they have already wasted a lot. And the last responsibility of the man to his wife is the man should make sure their children are deeply rooted in the things of God. I will tell you without fear of contradiction, I'm where I am because of my father's belief and my father's, you know, tough. On Sunday, you cannot stay home. My father and my mother, maybe if that is your own house. My mother will tell you if that is your own house, stay there. If I come back, let's meet. And it was looking to us as if she was controlling us, but look at me today. It is your responsibility as a parent, as a father, as a mother, to make your children are deeply rooted in the things of the Lord. If your children, you do not show them the foundation of church, when they grow old, how can you tell them about church? It is your responsibility to root them in the things of God. And the Bible says when they grow, they can't depart from it. They may do this, do that, be there, go there, but finally... Foundations are strong. It will pull them back to Christianity. Now I want to show you things that made Adam to fail in marriage. Because to me, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, Adam failed. There are things that failed the marriage of Adam. Write down. And I will show you examples of people who also succeeded in marriage. So that I don't only show you those who failed. I will also show you those who have succeeded. And the lessons that we learn. Why did Jacob fail, Abraham fail in marriage? Number one, Abraham was not a good communicator. Why did Abraham fail in marriage? Abraham was not a good communicator. There is a problem, he doesn't talk to his wife, he left his wife, so the wife is married, but she's singly, she's single but married. She's lonely. She doesn't talk to his wife. So the wife then gets room to have room to negotiate with with satan with the serpent because adam did not you know was not a good communicator number two adam did not give his wife company so she looked for company in the serpent adam failed because he did not give the wife company he was not a good communicator so the wife found this in the serpent and you know how it ended but if you check Jonadab in the book of Jeremiah 33, 35, verse 14, Jonadab succeeded in marriage. Adam failed in marriage, but Jonadab succeeded in marriage. Check Jeremiah 35, verse 14. Jeremiah 35, 14, the Bible says, And his children grew, and none of them were willing to depart from what their father taught them. The family was so successful, is that the way that children were following what parents taught them? Jonadab's marriage was successful. 35 verse 14 of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet 35 
verse 14. Jeremiah 35 verse 14. Jeremiah 35 verse 14. The Bible says, I hope somebody is being blessed. If you are being blessed, just type, I'm being blessed. <clears throat> just type, I'm being blessed. We have a few minutes to, to, to go now. Chapter 35 verse 14. And the word of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed. For to this day, they drink none. And obeyed their father's commandment. He told his children never try to drink alcohol. Never try to drink wine. The Bible says to date they never drank wine. That was a successful marriage. Very successful. What he taught his people. And your children will grow after you are kind. If you are a man that caused trouble with your wife. Your children will give you the same trouble. Because they saw it with you. If you are a woman that you give your husband trouble. Your daughters will give you trouble and your sons will give you trouble because they saw you giving trouble to their father. Jonadab's children were straight and what the father told them, they did not depart from it. Now listen to me. Abraham was also successful and you will be successful. I thought somebody would say amen there. Abraham was also successful, Jonadab was successful and you will be also successful. Now, what lessons do we learn? What lessons do we learn from what I've taught tonight? Let me show you some few things because of time. All these things I'm putting in a book, Who Stole My Wedding Gown? We are finishing the book of the prophetic this weekend and by God's grace, by August, I will have published the third book on the priesthood and God helping us, I will have published this book by December. I'm believing God to do four books this year. Minimum of four. Tomorrow, don't miss online on YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Prophet Robert Ouma. You can follow us on Instagram, Prophet Robert Ouma. And you can follow us on Facebook, Prophet Robert Ouma. And tomorrow we are day two, the voice of the prophet conference. And Friday is the last day. Then we meet on Sunday for the book launch. It will be very prophetic. Now, lesson number one that we learn from what I'm teaching and from the lives of the examples I've given. If you are not ready for marriage, don't jump into it. That is lesson number one. If you are not ready for marriage, don't jump into it. Don't be in a hurry. If you are not ready for marriage, don't jump into it. You're not competing with anybody. You're not competing with anybody. Don't jump into it. It doesn't matter the age. You may be 20, you may be 30, you may be 40, you may be 50. Better marry at 40 and marry well. Better marry at 50, marry well. Better never to marry at all and you stayed in peace than married and cried for the rest of your life. So if you are not ready, don't jump into marriage. Number two, lesson that you need to learn. Boys don't marry, men marry. Boys don't marry, men marry. You understand what I'm saying? Girls don't marry, small girls don't marry. It is women that are mature that they marry. Now, <clears throat> number three, it is wrong for sex to be the, con you know, to be conditional in marriage. As a married couple, it is wrong for sex to be conditional. You don't give me money. You don't buy me this. You put conditions on it. It will kill the marriage. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 to verse 5. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 to verse 5. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 to verse 5. Number, number four, marriage begins by two and does not give room for having children before marriage. Marriage begins by two and it does not give room to have children before marriage. Marriage begins by two. It doesn't give room. This thing of somebody, you are dating somebody for 10 years. 
Which Bible do you read? You are dating somebody for 20 years. You already have five children. This man is not your husband. Eh? The Bible says, how does that, where, where does it work from? Where does it come from? Marriage begins by two people. And the last one for tonight, marriage stands on the foundation of openness, trust, communication, and maturity. Because marriage is not for children. Marriage stands on openness, trust, communication, and maturity. Marriage is not for children. I will repeat for the last time. Marriage stands on openness, communication, trust, and maturity. Marriage is not for children. So if one of the two is not open to the other, you know, there is a life you are living, there is a card you are hiding, you don't want to show your husband or you don't want to show it to your wife, then there is a problem. You have your own life you don't want to share with your husband, you don't want to share with your wife. Then you are killing that marriage. I pray that your marriage will be successful in the name of Jesus. I pray that whatever you put your hands and your life to do will be successful. May this teaching bring you illumination. May this teaching bring you light. May this teaching help you. May this teaching bless you. And I command that in the name of Jesus, if there is anything that has confused your marital life, May it be removed in the name of Jesus. My God fight for you. My God bless you. You are open to bless me with an offering. You are saying, prophet, you have blessed me. You are, you are open to bless me back. The Bible says, them that bless me with my spiritual things, you are also allowed to bless them with material things. You don't have a church. You don't have a pastor. And you feel you want to send your tithe. I will receive your tithe as your prophet and I will bless you. Don't eat your tithe. Release your tithe. Let it go to the altar. We are meeting tomorrow, day two, the Voice of the Prophet Conference on Facebook, on YouTube, and in our church in Ebakasi. And on Friday, on Sunday, we are meeting for the book launch. It's my second book, and I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for us, of helping us to be able to publish that book. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram, Prophet Robert Oma. And follow us on YouTube and subscribe, Prophet Robert Oma. God bless you. God see you through. Shalom. The Lord is our peace. See you tomorrow. After the voice of the prophet conference, I'll be coming again to do the prophetic hour. God bless you. God prosper you. Shalom. The Lord is your peace.